Well, good morning. It's good to see you all here today. We are back in the book of Luke today. I hope you guys are going to find this enjoyable. It's the one miracle that actually goes throughout all of the Gospels. All four of them record this miracle, and we're going to look at it, and we're going to see why it's so important and how it's significant. Uh, but before we do that, let's, let's just pray together. Father, thank you so much that you're here and that you haven't left us alone as orphans. Lord, when you left, you said that you would send your Holy Spirit, and you did. Not only do you live inside of us, but Lord, you come at times and you pour yourself out into us and upon us. I pray that you help us now as we look at your word, that it might meet an inner need that each one of us comes with, and you have the ability to do that. You have the ability to feed all of us spiritually off of this little section of scripture. So, Lord, we come before you as your children, as ones who need spiritual feeding and direction and guidance and teaching and reproof and correction. I pray that you might help us, Lord, and help me to deliver it clearly. I pray that you might find what we do here acceptable to you. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Okay. So we're in Luke chapter 9. We're going to go through the first 17 verses, I, I really hope. And uh, we're going to take another walk uh, with Jesus and his disciples as we go through Jesus' early Galilean ministry. If you remember, we've been going through Luke in chapter 8. We saw Jesus' power over the natural elements as he rebuked the storm when the waves and the wind stopped instantly when he told them to. And they said, what manner of man is this, who even the wind and the waves obey him? We saw him go across the Gennesaret, the, the, the Sea of Galilee, and get to the other side. And he found a demoniac who was filled with demons, and he'd been that way for a long time, was able to break chains when he was imprisoned, and uh, basically lived in the tombs with the dead bodies. And his, the spirits that were in him called themselves legion because they were many. And of course, Jesus casts those demons out and puts them into a herd of pigs. And so these 2,000 pigs come rolling down the, the countryside and into the water. And so they're gone. This man is free, and the people in the Gennesaret are just scared to death of Jesus. And they say, you got to leave here. We, we, we can't have you here. It's not good for business. And so Jesus has power over those. Last week, we saw Jesus' faith over that uh, someone exercising faith in Jesus in their sickness, a woman who had been bleeding for 12 years, reached out and grabbed Jesus in the middle of him going somewhere else to take care of another problem, a little girl who had died at 12 years old. And in the middle of all that, he says, somebody touched me. And Peter says, Lord, we're, we're all touching each other. What do you mean? He says, I felt power go out for me which is interesting. It tells you why he falls asleep on boats. Because ministering to people takes energy, doesn't it? I don't know about you, but after a retreat, I'm bushed. Me too. Just ministering to people on Sunday. <laughs> and Sunday, I, get, I, I need a nap when this is all over. Yeah, ministering to people takes energy. It, it just expends you and you pour yourself out as it should be. And then we saw Jesus raise this little girl, um, Tabitha, and, and it raises her up, uh, Jairus' daughter, rather, and just breathes life into her just by telling her to get up. And uh, the power of Jesus all over, over all of these things, it's an amazing thing. As you see, he is not a man. He is God. He's the God-man. And he's a very different person than you and I are. So as we move on, we're going to see Jesus sending out the 12 disciples we're going to get a little blurb on Herod, and then we're going to look at the feeding of the 5,000. The feeding of the 5,000 is in every one of the Gospels, which tells you every one of the disciples thought it was important to mention. It was a life-changing event for them, um, as I imagine it would be. As feeding the 5,000 here, we don't have exactly 5,000, but we actually have food ready, so it'll be easy. 
thanks to Judy and her team. Praise God. So I don't know about you, I'm suddenly hungry. <laughs> In Luke chapter 9, verse 1, it says, Then he called the 12 disciples together. He gave them power and authority over demons to cure diseases. So let's look at that. And he sent them to preach the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. And he said to them, take nothing for your journey, neither staffs, nor bag, nor bread, nor money, and do not, and you do not have two tunics apiece. Whatever house you enter, stay there, and from there depart. And whoever will not receive you, when you go out to that city, shake off the very dust from your feet as a testimony against them. And so they departed and they went through the towns, preaching the gospel and healing everywhere. I just find that an amazing thing. The disciples, after this long period of time of following Jesus, where Jesus was the one doing all of the ministry, they had watched long enough. And Jesus said, it's your turn. And he confers on them the Holy Spirit or the power to be able to do these things. He gives them power and authority. Uh, power is a different thing than authority. You, you guys know that, right? Anybody that has a loaded gun in their hand has power, but they may not have the authority. Jesus gives them both, which I think is important. And so he gives them power and authority over demons and to cure diseases. I find it amazing that this particular gift was given before the cross. You know, we think of the spiritual gifts and we think of the, how God gives gifts to the church and all that, but this was given before the crucifixion, before the Holy Spirit was entering people. And I find that a rather interesting thing because all of the other gifts you don't see, but this one you do. And there are reasons why this happens. Jesus allows them to perform miracles because number one, he has compassion on people. And that's his motivation. In fact, it's stated right in the scripture. He had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. And so he heals them and he, and he um, casts out demons and he ministers to them and feeds them in this case as we come up upon it. Jesus had compassion on the people. Number two, it was something to teach them. In every one of the miracles that you see Jesus does, there is a learning. He's going to feed 5,000 people and then he's going to say, I'm the bread of life. He, he's going to come at a feast at a time when they pour water out and he says, I am the living water. Everything that Jesus does, there's more than just the simple statement of what Jesus is doing. There's, there's always something else and it's a teaching. And third of all, it's going to authenticate that he is the Messiah. And the teaching that they go out with, the power and authority is going to prove that Jesus is the Messiah. And so those are the three reasons that, that they come up with. And they preach the kingdom of God and they heal the sick. So there's two things they have to do. They didn't just have one job. They had two. Preach, which means I think you need power to do that as well. As well as heal. So they had these two things that they were going to send to do. And he said to them... Take nothing for your journey, neither staffs, nor bag, nor bread, nor money, and do not have two tunics apiece. All right, Jesus, so you want me to go with nothing? I don't know about you, but it's, it's even hard for me to separate from my cell phone. Can you imagine going out? Jesus says, go out. I'm going to give you power and authority. Just go out and find the messed up people and go fix them. Oh, don't take any money. Yeah, yeah, not an ATM card snuck away in your tunic, you know. No food, no staff, so you don't have a way to defend yourself against wild animals, uh, robbers on the road, uh, you know. Wow, uh, you're asking a lot, Jesus. I mean, when I go camping, I don't know about you, but I tend to overpack. You know, oh, I might need this. I, I might need this. Oh, I don't need anything else. Oh, I might need that, you know. And, Pretty soon your pockets are bloated and your trunk is hard to close. And, you know, you're just loaded with stuff, especially my wife's things. <laughs> my wife travels with her pillow, okay? So that's the beginning of the list. So there, there are lots of things, and I'm the pack animal that has to put it in the car, in the mini. So I'm, I'm well aware. So 
don't take anything with you. And you go, why would Jesus say that? Why would Jesus say that to you? You see, the more stuff that you carry with you, the more stuff you have to carry. And the more things that are a distraction from their mission, which is preaching and healing. Because, you know, you might have enough money to have a bunch of stuff, but then you got a bunch of stuff. And things need to be cleaned, fixed, repaired, insured, put in storage, you know. So I think there's a couple of things. In the middle of their heralding and their healing, they're supposed to not take anything. You're not supposed to have any other resource. You're going to be dependent and defenseless. And I think Jesus designed it that way so they would be dependent and defenseless. Because in and of ourselves, we like to supply our own needs. Don't you like to supply your own needs? I don't need nobody. I could do it. What are you doing there, Dave? I'm loading a credenza in the back of my car. You want a little help with that? Nah. It's just under 400 pounds. It's fine. <laughs> Jesus wanted them to be defenseless. He wanted them to be helpless and dependent upon God for everything. And I find that significant. Now, granted, it's only a short-term missions trip. Later on, Jesus says something different. He says, if, if you got an extra coat, take it. If you got money, make sure you have some. Do you got a sword? A sword? Yeah, Lord, we got two swords. Okay, that's enough. It was enough for Peter to do what he had to do, that's for sure. But these guys were armed and they, were, they had money in their pocket and they had food and they had, they had an extra pair of sandals. I mean, they were ready for a long-term mission trip. But you see, they learned to be dependent and defenseless before that. Amen. Jesus taught them first to do that. And then when all the other stuff came, it was great. And then what happens if you lost your extra sandals? Oh, well, big deal. I lived without them before. You know, it's, it's interesting. When you learn to live without anything and you get some things, when you lose those things, it's like no big deal. I lived without that before. Amen. I've had worse, you know. There's no other resource. He also told them when you go to a place and you enter, make sure that you enter the house and you stay there and from there depart. So if you're going to go into a city, announce that you're there to preach the good news of the kingdom of God. Find a place, find some worthy family. Actually, one of the other gospels says, find somebody who's worthy and stay with them. And you're going to eat their food and sleep on their couch and, you know, but don't look for any BBDs. You know what the BBD is? No. The bigger, better deal. Oh. Don't go shopping around like, like, hey, what's for dinner? Oh, well, we're having macaroni and cheese. Oh, that's nice. The neighbors are having T-bone. <laughs> Thanks for the offer. I think I'm going to stay with these folks over here. No bigger, better deal. You find a place, you settle in, you develop a relationship, and you stay there. You don't go bouncing around. It's not an opportunist uh, um, you know, playground out there where you're going to try to take advantage of people. Also, if they came in with a big backpack full of stuff and, you know, all this stuff, hey, how you doing? Yeah, I'm wondering if I could stay with you. People will wonder if, you know, you're going to rip them off. That's a big backpack. Where'd you get all that stuff? You know, but somebody who doesn't even have a, a stave, doesn't have extra sandals, doesn't have a coat. And they're like, yeah, here I am. It's just me. It's kind of harmless, right? So, and also, if you get to that city and no one will receive you, he says, shake the very dust from your feet as a testimony against them. By the way, the Jews used to do this. If they had to walk through Gentile territory, they would get to the border of Jerusalem and they would shake off their clothes. They would shake off all the dust and kick off their feet because they didn't want to bring any contaminated soil from the Gentile world into Jerusalem. It was this mentality of this is a, this is a holy place and I don't, want to, I don't want to get any of this in there. You know, if you go out and you cut the lawn, you, you know, take your shoes off or whatever you have to do. It's similar to that. But this is a testimony against the people. Hey, we came, we tried to speak to you and you didn't listen. So we're done. I'm kicking off my shoes. I'm not taking any of this with me. It, it's on you. It's essentially what it was. So I want you to get in there. I want you to stay put, not bounce around. Don't take a bunch of stuff and then make a clean exit. 
So he gives them some, some pretty cool things. As far as missions, that's a pretty good way to go. What's your mission? What are you going to do? They know very clearly what they're there to do. There's nothing worse than sending somebody out on a mission and you don't know what you're doing. So what are you doing here? I don't know. I was told it was a mission strip. So I went, you know, <laughs> what are we doing? I don't know. Well, what are you doing here? So gives them very clear guidelines, says this is what I want you to do. You can also check out Matthew or Mark if you want to see that. And of course, we're in Luke and John mentions uh, a little bit later. I think it's a, an interesting thing. Jesus says here in Luke 640, if you remember, a disciple is not above his teacher, but everyone who is perfectly trained or, or well-trained or maturely well-rounded will be like his teacher. I think that's interesting. You, you also tend to become like the people you spend time with, right? And so if you have really bad friends, they'll corrupt good morals. We understand that from Proverbs. So be careful who you hang around with because you'll start to be like them. And if you don't like the way that the people that you're spending time with are, don't spend time with them because you're going to start to be like them. I remember when I first came to know Jesus Christ, I was coming out of the whole drug culture and, uh, and if I was going to hang out with those guys, I had to do what those guys did. And very often I was in a, I was in a car and sometimes I was even driving. And I had to go where they wanted to go and do what they had to do. And I finally had to make a choice. Either I'm going to serve the Lord or I'm going to hold on to these friends. And when I didn't do what my friends did, when I wasn't getting drunk and I wasn't getting high, suddenly I wasn't their friends. I, or or I, wasn't, I wasn't their friend. So you wonder, what kind of friendship is that? Anyway. A disciple is not above his teacher, but everyone who's perfectly trained would be like his teacher. The more time you spend with Jesus, the more you'll be like Jesus. The more that you get the word into you, the more the word of God is going to come out of you. And that's a, a beautiful thing. It's a, I think it's a wonderful promise. It's a nice principle to know. So Jesus sends them out, shake the dust, and they went through and they did exactly what Jesus said. And apparently he set a time and a place for them to meet. So we'll all meet up, you know, at the McDonald's or whatever. Now Herod, the Tetrarch, heard of all that was done by him, and he was perplexed, because it was said by some that John had risen from the dead, and by some that Elijah had appeared, and by others that one of the old prophets had risen again. He's got a lot of bad information here. Herod said, John, I have beheaded, but who is this of whom I hear such things? And he sought to see him. Isn't it interesting? This guy who's the tetrarch of the area, he wants to see Jesus because Jesus is doing these things. But we find out his interest in Jesus is more like getting tickets to the circus. He's interested in the entertainment value of Jesus doing things. So he wants to see what Jesus is up to. This gives you a little bit of idea who Herod is. By the way, there, there's more than just one Herod. So that's not his name, that's his title. So Herod Antipas is his name. And he's one of the Tetrarch. Tetrarch means uh, a quarter ruler. He's, he's one of four rulers over this region. And so that's why he's called that. How many of you didn't know that? You learned something today. So the Tetrarch, he, he was living from 4 BC to about 39 AD. He's the son of Herod the Great. Herod the Great had four sons, actually, which is why he's a Tetrarch. He's one of four. So that's why he's ruling. Um, he was... Uh, he was sent to Gaul. Actually, he, you know a little bit about this Herod, right? You know, Herod the Great. Herod the Great was there when Jesus was born. And he, the wise men came, the Magi came, and he says, well, where are you from? And where are you going? And what are you doing? And they said, we're here to see the king, the king that's born. We saw a star. And he's like, give me a minute. He checks with his Jewish advisors and they say, oh, of course, we know where he's going to be. He's going to be born in Bethlehem. That's what the scripture says. Bethlehem Ephrathah, not the other Bethlehem. And he goes, cool. He goes to them and says, listen, when you find him, let me know so I can go worship him too. Well, the, the star took a left turn and they followed it and they found out where the child lay. By the way, he wasn't an infant at this point. He was older and he was in a house. He wasn't in a manger. That's why the kings don't really go with the shepherds. But so, so 
they follow, they find him, and then they're warned in a dream to go somewhere else. And Herod has all the little boys from two years old down killed. Says, I can't find the exact one, no problem. I'll get rid of all of them. Joseph, being warned in a dream, took his wife and his child, and they went to Egypt for a while until Herod died. And so his four sons end up taking over and taking power from him and going. So this is Herod the Great. By the way, he named himself that. I've always thought, if I was going to name myself, what would I call myself? Dave the Round. That works. But of course, you know, you know that he had a wife, and this wife was the daughter of somebody from Arabia who happened to be a king. Bad news if you want to divorce her, dude, just don't do it. And started a war because he divorced his wife, and he marries his brother's wife. Yeah, she, there's a song in my head. She gets around. Oh, sorry. So he also marries Herodias, which is his brother Philip's wife, which caused some trouble for John the Baptist because he pointed the finger at him, told him to cut it out. His mother's name was Malthrace, which is uh, not a name you see much. But this is the area in which he was basically the one who was in control. You see Herod Philip's area there and then Archelaus down below. So this is the, this is the Herod that later interviews Jesus before he goes to the cross. Remember Pilate, he's interviewing Jesus and he goes, you know, I'm, you're really doing most of your ministry in Galilee. I'm going to send you over here. I'm going to pass the buck to this guy. Let him make a choice. And uh, Herod wants him to do something. He goes, do something for us, Jesus. And Jesus didn't say a word. And he's like, you're no fun. And he sends him back. So that's Herod. And of course, he marries his brother's wife. And, you know, she's a woman who's been pointed out by John the Baptist as being an adulteress. And he as an adulterer. And of course, he has John's head cut off. But he didn't want to. Because he was maybe hoping John was going to bribe him or maybe he'd do a trick. Maybe he'd do a miracle. You know, John the Baptist never did a miracle ever. Not one. But everybody was afraid of him because he spoke the truth in your face. We need more like that. Amen. So she has her daughter, his niece, dance in front of him, and he gets all sexually excited and says, I'll give you anything you want up to half my kingdom. What a worthless piece of garbage. Anyway, to be ruled by your loins is a terrible thing. And to give away half your kingdom to a girl who's your niece, who just danced in front of you, in front of her mom. Who's your second wife? You know, like, it's a mess. It's a, just a mess. Don't do it. So, and he says, okay, I'll give you anything you want. And because her mother prompted her, she said, I want the head of John the Baptist on a platter. And he was sorry he said anything. So don't, don't set your eyes on things you shouldn't because you never know what's going to happen. So he heard all these things that were done, and this is a, a famous picture of his niece dancing before him when he got all excited. And of course, you know, he's, uh, he gets all whacked out. There's an inner artist somewhere in me, but it's just not, it's not coming out. Jesus speaks of him later. As he's speaking the truth and he's speaking to the Pharisees and the, and the Sadducees, they decide they want to try to shut Jesus down. And so they start here in Luke chapter 13. We'll get to it someday. On that very day, some Pharisees came saying to him, get out and depart from here for Herod wants to kill you. They probably said it like that. And he said to them, go tell that fox. Behold, I cast out demons and perform cures today and tomorrow. And the third day I shall be perfected. I like the way he talks. He's kind of like his cousin. He called him a fox. Do you think he looks like a fox? I don't know. You go tell that fox. By the way, that was a degrading comment because foxes are sly and they're slick and they're weaselly. You know, if you ever catch them, you know, like Dino catches them breaking in and killing his chickens, they run. They don't stick around. You know, they don't stand and fight. They just get the heck out of Dodge. So that's why he called him that. 
And so he calls him a fox, and it's interesting because later he gets interviewed by him, and he doesn't say one word. I mean, literally, not a word. Like a lamb before his shears is dumb, and so he spoke not a word. Verse 10, and the apostles, when they had returned, told him all that they had done. And then he took them and went aside privately into a deserted place belonging to the city of Bethsaida. So Jesus had them all go out. They cast out demons everywhere they went. They preached the kingdom of God everywhere they went. They all had this remarkable time together. And by the way, they went out two by two, which is pretty smart. Maybe that's why the Jehovah Witnesses do it. I don't know. Be twice as annoying. But you get two, you get two disciples and they, they kind of keep track of each other. They, they're an accountable pair. You know, it's, you know, two are better than one because there's a good return for their uh, labor. By the way, they were going to Bethsaida. Bethsaida is like this beautiful green lush area. So Jesus says, listen, you've, you, you've had it tough, guys. I sent you out without any food. I sent you without equipment. I sent you, and you guys all came back. You, you met at the right time. Uh, where'd Thomas? Is Thomas a little late? You know. So everybody's together and they're finally getting, Jesus says, come on, let's go. You know, you could tell me about all the wonderful things and I can imagine them. You should have seen what I did. I cast out a demon and, and he went and then this crazy thing happened and, uh, and they're like all trying to talk over each other like the disciples do, like men do. <laughs> Nobody agrees. Okay, well, it's true. <laughs> and so they're going to go from Capernaum where you see the up, upper section here. They're going to go over to Bethsaida, which is this beautiful lush valley area. And so they're going on a little vacation. Okay, and this is actual picture of it. If you want to know what it looks like, that's the Sea of Galilee, and it's uh, from one of the mountains that are there. And it's, uh, it's just this beautiful lush area, and it's historically known as the place where Jesus fed the 5,000. So he's trying to get away. Let's, let's get away, guys. Let's talk about all this. Let's digest what happened. And, you know, if, if you had any real trouble, like anything you couldn't handle, maybe I could help you with it. And so Jesus is taking them away, just like the song that we sang to today. And so they're going to Bethsaida. By the way, Bethsaida means... House of fish. We're going to the house of fish. Oh, I love fish. So they're having, you know, they're having these ideas that, you know, we're going to go away with Jesus. We're going to meet him in this place. We're going to just have a great time together. We're going to sit in the grass. Maybe we'll go swimming and we'll do some fishing. It's like a men's retreat. And they're like, awesome. Let's go, Jesus. Let's do this. And by the way, notice they're now called Apostles. They've been disciples up to this point. They've been learners. And now they're apostles, which means sent out ones. They're his ambassadors that have been sent out. And so they got a promotion. I don't know if they got a diploma, but they did get a promotion because they're now called apostles. But when the multitudes knew it, they followed him. And he received them and spoke to them about the kingdom of God and healed those who had need of healing. <coughs> you ever been excited about something and then suddenly something else interrupts you as you're on your way to maybe a vacation? A little seaside retreat and then suddenly something else happens. There's a need, there's an emergency, there's something that arises that's more important than you just kind of kicking back and relaxing. And so they were excited about sitting down and sharing testimonies. And then pretty soon people start showing up and they're like, uh, hi, how you doing? Yeah. What are you doing here? Oh, well, Peter told us you guys were meeting here and we, you know, we just wanted to see the, the savior and, you know, and people just start showing up and trickling in and surrounding them. And there's no more nice retreat. We're going to unwind and take it easy and talk about all these wonderful testimonies because all of these people are here and they got much bigger needs. And so now they're all busy. There is no retreat. There's no relaxing. There's no eating. There's no nothing because they're busy with all sorts of things. Have you ever had people at your house that just stayed too long? Not you guys. But there are people, and they just keep coming. Apparently, somebody leaked where Jesus was going to be, and everybody finds out. And, of course, they bring their weary, they're tired, they're, 
and everybody is showing up. And the disciples are like, we're going to the house of fish. We were going to talk, you know, we were going to do things. I was going to have an espresso, you know, and so they're all excited, but it's just not happening. Do you, do you know what that's like? I know what that's like. You got a plan, you got an idea, and you go, oh, we just had the most incredible time, and the Lord blessed us with all these things I can't wait to share with my brothers. And Jesus, who gave his power and authority over these demons, and by the way, later on, they boast of it. They say, demons listen to us. And Jesus said, don't be so excited that demons listen to you. You should be more excited that your name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life, that you're going to make it, you're going to make it to heaven and spend eternity. So don't get so excited about the power. And by the way, it's not of you anyway. So I, I would add that little subtext. But they had all this excitement about going away. And now the disciples in the middle of all this are looking at the clock and going, this has been going on all day. Remember, Jesus sent them out without food. So they haven't eaten. And so this is the morning time when they're trying to get away. And it lasts all day. It's much more than the pastor going 10 minutes over his sermon. <laughs> so there's hunger that's gripping them now. And disappointment that they don't get to spend time with Jesus, that they don't get to spend time with their brothers. They don't get to share their, their stories. I don't get to share my story. This is the most awesome story. It beats all you guys. I can't wait. And it doesn't happen. And so they're suddenly crowded. You can barely hear, you know, that's the picture. And when the day began to wear away, I love that term, and it wore away. Like, it's starting to get dark out. It's been all day. You guys think you have a long day. The 12 came and said to him, send the multitude away that they may go into the surrounding towns and country and lodge and get provisions for we are in a deserted place here. The 12 come to Jesus and complain. Too much ministry, Jesus. You're over-serving here, bro. Like, come on, what happened to our house of fish? And so they're hungry and they're disappointed. This is what's really going on. Whenever somebody comes to you and they feign like they're concerned for other people, they're usually not. It's usually about who. Who's hungry? They are. <laughs> Who wants to go and find a place to stay? They do. Who wants to go to a surrounding city and, you know, go to the house of fish? They do. They're not concerned about these people. You may not have seen this, but I'm a selfish person, and I, I know what they're thinking because the scripture tells me. Luke 6.31, another version of this, and Jesus said to them, come aside by yourselves to a deserted place and rest a while. For there were many coming and going and they did not even have time to eat. Jesus and all the disciples are famished, all day ministering, nothing to eat. And now the sun is going down. They've missed a few meals now. This is really what they meant to say. Jesus, how long are you going to be with all these people? I thought you were going on a restful retreat where we could tell you all the cool things that we've been doing. We are tired and hungry. Can't you send these annoying, needy, burdensome, codependent, selfish, <laughs> nagging people away? How about a little me time? The question is, when they talk about these annoying, needing, burdensome, codependent, selfish, nagging people, who are they talking about? They become those people. It's interesting. I find it very interesting. It's the principle of judging. Like when you're judging somebody and you find fault with somebody for a particular reason and you got a pet peeve that this person is getting away with something, it's usually something in your own life. 
because we're inherently selfish. You can learn a lot about yourself by analyzing what you're critical of and what you're short on patience with. Anyway, so that's really the subtext of what's going on. And I don't think I'm going too far afield from the scripture because it says in Mark that they were hungry. And so what's their problem? We're hungry. They're a little hangry. Just go away. You ever feel that way? Just go away. Just leave me alone. Yes. Just go away. You know, it's 11 o'clock at night and you had people over your house and they've been here for like a long time. You want to give them a napkin that says, go home. <laughs> oh, that's funny. Napkin says, go home. That's hilarious. Yeah. <laughs> My bed's calling me. You know, but they had this really bad habit of doing it. The disciples did this all the time. They just wanted to keep Jesus to themselves or, or something. Mark 10, 48 to 49 says, many warned him to be quiet. But he cried out all the more. This is a guy who was born blind on the side of the road who hears a parade. He hears people coming up the road and he goes, what's going on? I say, well, Jesus is coming. Jesus of Nazareth. Really? And he starts crying out for Jesus. And he says, son of David, have mercy on me. He's on the side of the road blind. What do you think he wants? He wants to be healed. And he has faith or he wouldn't cry on the son of David, recognizing him as the Messiah. So Jesus stood still and commanded him to be called. And then they called the blind man saying to him, be of good cheer, rise, he is calling you. The many who were telling him to shut up were the disciples. They're coming down the street, out of the way, out of the way, Messiah coming. And this guy cries out, Jesus, son of David. Hey, quiet old man. Messiah's coming up the road. Move back, move back. You know, they're, they're acting like, you know, the secret service, you know. They told him to shut up. They had a habit of doing this, of shooing people away from Jesus. It's no different in this case. There was another time, Matthew 19, verses 13 to 15. The little children were brought to him that he might lay his hands on them and pray. But the disciples rebuked them. But Jesus said, let the little children come to me and do not forbid them for of such is the kingdom of heaven. Unlike you guys, really what I think he's trying to say. And he laid his hands on them and he departed from there. There were women who wanted to bring their children to Jesus so he might pray over them. And the children wanted to go see Jesus. Uh, no, no, too important, too important. You can't see Jesus, it's too important. Stand back, stand back. Got important things to do, places to go, people to see. You, back off a little bit, you know. Wow, isn't that interesting? Yes. Why do we do that? It's curious. I have any number of you who when you want to talk to me, I can tell because you're looking at me like this. And maybe somebody steps in front of our eye contact and then you, you step a little aside so you can be seen and you're at, at least six feet away. And I'm listening and I'm, I'm trying to wrap it up because I know there's someone here I need to talk to. And I say, that's, hang on for just a second. Can I help you? Pastor, I'm really, I'm so sorry to bother you. I'm really, I am. It's interesting, we, we have like an invisible disciple somewhere and they're saying, hey, 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 can't you see he's talking, come on. You're not gonna, or people that come to my office, they'll look in the window and I'll raise my head and they move. <laughs> it happened this morning a couple times. It was Carl doing it. And then, and then when I look up and I see him bringing his head down to look through the window, and he goes, no, no, no. And I go, and he'll open the door and he'll stick his head in. Hey, can I talk to you for a minute? Yeah, sure. That's what this means. Just come in. Oh, I, I know, I know you're busy. I, I, 
You don't know anything. <laughs> but we're already in trepidatious about approaching people and the disciples aren't helping anything. They're not helping anything. Just stay back, stay back. And now they're like hangry and they're like, Jesus, come on, the house of fish, let's go. Send these people away. I think flat out said, send these people away. It's amazing. And Jesus doesn't rebuke them. He doesn't say anything to demean them. He knows exactly what their motives are. He knows exactly what's on their mind. He probably hears their stomachs growling. And he doesn't demean them. I love that. Do you realize this is a test? This is a test. Are you willing to follow me? Really? Are you a disciple? Are you a follower? Are you willing to forego some meals maybe? Did you forget all the lessons that you learned when I sent you away with nothing? That the Lord will provide for your needs and you don't have to sweat it. Yeah. And you don't have to get anxious and you don't have to shoot people away. Uh, subtext. But he said to them, you give them something to eat. I love that. Pastor Dave, we got a real problem. You know, you should fix that. <laughs> no, 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 no. I'm telling you so you could fix it. Okay, what's the problem? Well, so-and-so is always sitting in my seat. I'm sorry, I didn't know I had a seat. I know I don't. Anyway, you give them something to eat. So they're complaining because they want to shoo these people away so they can go to the house of fish. And you give them something to eat. These guys were just all full of themselves saying, we cast out demons. And I can't wait to tell Jesus my story and everyone will be impressed. And Jesus says, you take care of it. It's like they totally forgot what Jesus just taught them. Can you relate? And they said, we have no more than five loaves and two fish unless we go and buy food for all these people. Luke is being kind. He's kind of mashing. He's a Gentile, and so he's writing everything from a Gentile point of view, and he's going somewhere with this. And he's just trying to give us an overview. But the other passages actually give us a little bit more information. Um, let me show you. In John 6, 8 to 9, one of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, says to him, there's a lad here who has five barley loaves and two small fish. And I imagine a long pause. But what are they among so many? The reason they've got five loaves, and by the way, they're just like little biscuits. And they're made out of barley. Barley's, uh, you would feed that to an animal or someone who's poor. It's not flour, nice and fluffy, full of air. It's not like a croissant, you know. It's more like, it's more like a lead balloon in, in, in the form of a bread. And it's crunchy when you crunch on it. You know, it's like multigrain bread, but like on steroids. So it's, this is what a poor person would eat. And some little boy was packing a lunch. His mom, who was thoughtful and said, we're going to go see the Messiah. You know, I'm going to make sure you got a lunch. Packed it. And a lot of times they kept it in their sleeves. You know, they had these big puffy sleeves with a little secret pocket, you know, so they could, you know, conceal carry uh, their lunch. And so that's, that's where they're at. And this is where they came up with it. They hijacked this kid's lunch. He's got two little fish, a couple of sardines, and a couple of pieces of bread. I can imagine Andrew going, oh, he's got food, and grab it and say, Lord, we have five loaves and two fish. You got to love his optimism, though. He brings this to Jesus. And then I imagine all the disciples staring him down, like, what are you thinking? And he goes... <laughs> Yeah, but what are these among so many? It's like almost, you almost had it, Andrew. You were so close. <laughs> he has a shy faith. You know, as soon as he gets looked at by the disciples, he's, you know, well, you know, I'm sorry I brought it up. In fact, it's not really even mine. It's really this kid's I just hijacked. So, and here's from Mark 6:37. we're told, and he answered and said to them, you give them something to eat. And they said to him, Shall we go and buy 200 denarii worth of bread and give them something to eat? 
you had somebody who was the accountant. In every group, there's one. Who's counting. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Little abacus action. Check the purse. We've got 200 denarii. That's all we got. If we go to the store right now and we buy food and we spend every penny we have, not everyone is going to even be able to get a bite. It's interesting. Andrew is kind of on the edge of a miracle. And there's somebody else counting the cost and trying to figure out how we're going to get this thing done. Because that's what we do, right? Hey, we were thinking about adding some more chairs. Well, how much will that cost? And what will be the setup? And where will they go? And what about all the other things that we have? And that's what we do. We try to figure things out. And we, we want to make sure we don't overextend ourselves. And we want to make sure we're responsible. So you got Mr. Estimator Man over there estimating. It's funny nobody went to Jesus. Except send them away. Too many people. Pastor Dave, you don't have a problem with parking. You got a problem with people. You need to ask some of these people just not to come. <laughs> That's what the disciples would do. So what we have in this picture is some innocent, good-hearted, well-intended failures. <laughs> some good-hearted, innocent, good ideas, but not really what Jesus was thinking about. And so you probably heard this parable before, so it's a spoiler alert. You know how it ends. There were about 5,000 men. By the way, they didn't count women and children. They just counted head of households back then. Ladies, don't be too offended. offended. It's a Jewish thing. So imagine most of the men were married and those folks had children. You have near 10,000 people. 10 thousand people. I don't know if you've been among 10,000 people. It's a lot of people. And they're all trying to get to Jesus. And he said to his disciples, make them sit down in groups of 50. That's interesting. Why 50? It could have been 65. It could have been 100. In one of the passages, it says, have them sit down in groups of 50 and 100. I can just imagine, you know, people sitting in 50s and trying to figure out what 50 looks like. And of course, you got the estimator man. You know, one, two, three, four. You know, people trying to keep it to 50. And then there were some groups that morphed into 100. So there were two groups together. And, and the estimator man's gone. It's not 50. What that did was, and they all sat down in the grass. What that did was created pathways. Because if you're going to serve that many people, you got to get to them. And everybody just crowding in on Jesus over these five loaves and two fish, it's not going to be good. So he tells the disciples, have them sit down in groups of 50. Now, they hadn't read the Bible yet. They didn't know what Jesus was doing. They're like, send them away. He goes, no, have them all sit down. You get them something to eat. Well, what are we going to go get bread? We got to have them sit down in groups of 50. All right. You guys get in a group of 50. You get now they 12 men have to go out among probably 10,000 people and get them to sit down in groups of 50 and 100. Jesus was probably pleased. He's like, I finally got him off my neck. <laughs> Give him something to do. Sent them out to sit in groups of 50 and 100. So they came and made them all sit down. And he took the five loaves and the two fish. And looking up to heaven, he blessed and broke them. I love this. You know, when we say a blessing or when we thank God, we are asking God to bless. Jesus didn't ask anybody to bless it. He blessed it. Because he is who he is. And he broke them and he gave them to the disciples to set before the multitude. Now that's a ridiculous statement. I got, I got two fish and five pieces of bread. Here, set this before the multitude. You know, Jesus asked you to do the same now. Except the meal you're giving them to is a spiritual meal. 
And to them, it doesn't seem like much. I can imagine Jesus in this picture. So this is what I have to work with. <laughs> Matthew 14, 18, Jesus says, bring them to me. Bring these things to me. That is one of the most awesome passages that I have had the pleasure of viewing recently. Bring them to me. Because in the hands of Jesus, a little is much. In the hands of Jesus, multitudes are fed. In the hands of Jesus, demons run. In the hands of Jesus, healing happens. In the hands of Jesus, the impossible happens. In the hands of Jesus. Bring them here to me. So what do you have for him to work with? What do you guys have for Jesus to work with? You know, the one who much is given, much is required. Yes. And we have so much. Yes. So what do you have for him? So they all ate and were filled. By the way, that word is glutted. You know what that means? That's like recliner, <laughs> feet up, Thanksgiving Day, falling asleep in front of football. Tryptophanic coma. They were glutted, glutted, 10,000 people. And 12 baskets of leftover fragments were taken up by them. Because Jesus is an ecologist. He doesn't let anything go to waste. And they pick up the fragments, the leftovers, from all the people, which gives the disciples something to do other than complain. And they each come back with a basket full of leftovers. Guess who's going to eat that? The guys who didn't eat all day. Worked out well for them after all, didn't it? So I can imagine the disciples going out and being completely floored by what Jesus just did. And each one of them comes back with a basket. I would have felt completely humble at that point about any of the complaining that I've done. Interesting oxymorons in the scripture. We seek and we find. We serve and we're served. We lose and we gain. We die and we live. We give and we receive. When we do something for the Lord Jesus Christ, he has a way of making it beautiful and it is filling for us. Serving the Lord God is one of the greatest privileges in life. But we tend to forget about it. We tend to forget that Jesus works this way. We think, well, I'm feeling a little hungry. I need to make time for me. And we don't think about others. And it's backwards. Matthew 6, 25 to 26, Jesus said, Therefore I say to you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, or about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air, for they neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? Do you not remember that you have a heavenly Father who loves you? Could it be that you're in the middle of a test? Could it be he's trying to communicate something to you of eternal value? and you get focused on some temporal, physical thing. We forget about it. Matthew 16, 8 to 9. Jesus, being aware of it, said to them, O oh, you of little faith, why do you reason among yourselves? Because you have brought no bread. Jesus begins to tell a parable about the Sadducees and the Pharisees, and he says, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and Sadducees. And they go, oh, he's mad at us because we didn't bring any bread. That's what he means. Brilliant. And Jesus says, you guys have such little faith. Why do you argue among yourselves that you brought no bread? Do you not yet understand or remember the five loaves and the 5,000 and how many baskets you took up? 
Wasn't an entire basket full of food enough to convince you that you don't have to worry about food? You don't have to worry about anything. In fact, that's why I sent you out with nothing. Did you worry then? No, well, then why are you worried now? Because it's really hard to unlearn that behavior, isn't it? Yes. So, Luke 6, 38, Jesus tells us, give and it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together and running over will be put into your bosom or into your lap. For with the same measure that you use, it will be measured back to you. So as we do things for the Lord, we do with the things that he wants us to do. And as we think about loving it on other people and giving to them, there is no way that you are going to exceed what God is going to give to you. And it says that he will fill, you could pull your apron up. They used to pull their aprons up and they used to get, you know, filled with barley or, or wheat or whatever it is. And it's the picture of pulling up your apron and somebody dumping out a giant basket and shaking it all up, making sure it's pounded down as much as it can be. And then they pour some more so it's pouring over. You don't ever have to worry about quantity. You don't ever have to worry that the Lord's going to rip you off or that you're going to end up short. It's the people that are most generous with their time and their talents and their treasures that know the blessings and the miracles of God. Amen. And when we get stingy and start thinking about me time, and it's, what about me? It never goes well. We miss the opportunity to be filled. Amen. A couple of fish, and a few loaves looked a lot like that. And Jesus in his hands did miracles with it. Going to give you a quick preview of next week. Maybe you'll come back. <laughs> and it happened as he was alone praying that the disciples joined him and he asked them saying, well, who do the crowds say that I am? And they answered and said, John the Baptist and some say Elijah and others say that one of the old prophets has risen again. That sounds so familiar because that's what they told Herod. Yep. And he said to them, but who do you say that I am? And Peter answered and said, the Christ of God. And he strictly warned and commanded them to tell this to no one, saying, the son of man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised on the third day. This represents the end of Jesus's Galilean ministry where he was in Capernaum, he was in all of these areas doing all this ministry. From now on, you're going to see Jesus focus his attention on Jerusalem. And that's where he's headed. This is the first time Jesus tells his disciples his mission in full. I'm going to Jerusalem, I'm going to be hung on a cross and I'm going to die. But I'll rise again. And they were like, what? First time Jesus shares that mission with them. Notice he tells them after the feeding of the 5,000, after they've, they see a demon run out, after they see the wind and the waves obey him, after all of these things, they should know who Jesus is. Peter stands up one of his great shining moments when he knows what to say and he says the right thing. But there was inspiration and revelation before there was information. Jesus couldn't entrust them with this information up to this point, but he can now. And they're no longer disciples, they're now apostles. Everything kind of changes at this point. Faith is rewarded with intimacy. Boldness is rewarded by knowledge. Jesus will give you more when you use what you have and when you're faithful with what you have. So we'll talk about that next week. I'd, I'd like you to contemplate what do you have for Jesus to use today? I'll bet you have more than you knew. And I'll bet you in his hands, it will become much more profitable and much more fruitful for the kingdom of God than you ever thought could happen. Mm -hmm.